Good evening, folks. I'm Brent Holland from Night Fright. The JFK assassination conspiracy resounds to today. The government's investigation into the assassination resulted in the Warren Report, and its conclusion stated that there was no evidence of a conspiracy, and indeed, Lee Harvey Oswald had acted alone. Long before the advent of databases, the Internet and cell phones, a grassroots movement erupted on the scene to challenge the Warren Commission's findings. John Kellen has a new book called Praise from a Future Generation, documenting the unexpected journey these early JFK researchers embarked upon. But first, to set the night, let's listen to a clip. In the clip, you'll hear lawyer Mark Lane, one of the first-generation researchers. Mark Lane was a lawyer who was asked to represent Lee Harvey Oswald and his interests in the Warren Commission. Lane went on to interview witnesses to the assassination, what the witnesses revealed to Lane was either far different than what ended up in the Warren Commission or brand new stuff that the Warren Commission completely omitted. Lane then released a documentary based on this information. The documentary, Rush to Judgment, released in 1965, just two years after the assassination on that November day, 1963. Rush to Judgment lit the country on fire. In it, witnesses were recounting having heard or seeing the shots come from what we have come to know as the Grassy Knoll. In the clip I'm about to play, Mark Lane is interviewing S.M. Holland, no relation. S.M. Holland was situated on the train overpass directly in front of the motorcade. As the motorcade advanced, it had to go under this uh, train overpass, very similar to what we see on uh, Brady Street. So imagine a group of people watching from on top of the train overpass. He had several of his co-workers, and they all had ringside seats and great overview of the assassination. He and his co-workers all saw the same thing, coming from the grassy knoll, and believed the shot that killed Kennedy came from there. Let's listen to the clip. Is this the exact spot you were standing on on November 22nd, Mr. Holland? That's correct. This is the exact spot that I was standing on November the 22nd waiting for the parade. And where did you hear that third shot come from? Right over about 20 or 30 feet from the other end of that little picket fence. And where was the smoke that you saw? It gripped you right out underneath those green trees, those two trees. From behind the fence? From behind the fence. It kind of hung there just like a, for a few seconds, long enough that you could see the upper you, smoke. And then what'd you do? Immediately after the president's car came underneath this overpass, a four of us broke around around this fence to find out if we could see anybody leaving the air. Tonight, it's the President John Kennedy assassination. Oh, by the way, all the rumors you've ever heard about the assassination are true. This is going to be a great show, folks. Strap in and hang on. Here we go. There is a time to question. There is a time for answers. There is a time to challenge. There is a time to speculate. There is a time for change. There is a time for truth. The time is now. Welcome to Night Fright, your voice in the dark for Paranormal and Conspiracy Radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. Good evening. I'm pleased to welcome to Night Fright for the very first time, live on the phone from Colorado, John Kellen. Welcome to the show, John. Are you there? I'm here. Oh, thank goodness. Okay. Thanks for having me on, uh, Brent. It's our great pleasure. Just to start us off, can you give us a brief synopsis of your book and uh, its importance, I guess, amongst the current library of research publications? Uh, for example, why did you write it? Who or what was your inspiration? Sure. Um, those are several questions uh, in one there, Brent, but we'll we'll take it a uh, step at a time. The 
The name of the book, uh, as you mentioned, is Praise from a Future Generation, and it's about the earliest critics of the Warren Report, as you said. Uh, it's uh, probably about a dozen or so people that I really focus on uh, in the book, like Mark Lane, who you mm -hmm. uh, had a little audio clip there off the top. Uh, also, uh, Vince Delandria, uh, who was a lawyer in Philadelphia, a woman named Sylvia Marr, uh, Harold Weisberg, for example, mm, and uh, others such as uh, uh, Penn Jones Jr., uh, who was a newspaper editor in Texas, not too far from Dallas, uh, a, a businessman in Los Angeles named Raymond Marcus, uh, a housewife uh, in Beverly Hills, not too far from Ray Marcus, uh, and they became friends, a woman named um, uh, Maggie Field, um, and in Oklahoma, a woman named Shirley Martin. And let's see, I'm probably forgetting somebody, but... Uh, uh, maybe we'll get to some more names uh, as we progress. But those are those are some of the people that uh, that I wrote about. Um, uh, these people, the re as, as for why I wrote it, these these people, in in my view, have had a huge impact mm. on public opinion over the years, over you know, forty five years now uh, since the assassination. But today, most people, I think, don't really know who they were, don't really know their names, and I'm hoping that in some small way, my my book can rectify that. I would really. Uh, hope to give them the credit that I think is their due. I agree with you wholeheartedly. After you've written the book, what makes researchers tick, do you think? Well, you know, uh, you're dealing with a, a handful of individuals, so I think their motivations were, were uh, probably varied. But generally, I, I think you can say that uh, most of them saw that uh, something wasn't right and with, with the story that they were hearing out of Dallas mm -hmm. back in November of 1963 and they were not the sort of people who could um, just sit by and, and watch. Ray Marcus actually had a pretty interesting comment uh, on that. Um, like the others, he began studying the case completely on his own and mm -hmm. pretty much on the very day of the assassination. And he described his his uh, skepticism like this. I've got some extensive notes in front of me, and I'm going to refer be referring to you as we progress. I can no problem. I can tell you this is a, a direct quote. Mm -hmm. So Ray said, uh, "By the evening of, of November 22nd, 1963, I found myself being drawn into the case. The government was saying there was only one assassin; that there was no conspiracy. It was obvious that even if this subsequently turned out to be true, it could not have been known to be true at that time." End quote. Mm. So, in other words, things were happening just too fast. You know, there's there's yeah. no way they could have known at such an early point uh, that 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 there was no conspiracy and that uh, that they had the one guy who did it. Do you feel the catalyst for the researchers because they were all independent? And we've got to remember, in those days, there was no internet to bind people together. There was no cell phones. If you wanted to use a telephone, indeed, it was very expensive to call long distance. I remember as a kid, we would reserve our long distance phone calls till Sundays only because that's when Bell Canada would give us a break on long distance phone calls. So that was the big key day to call everyone. Do you feel that there was a common catalyst that plunged all these people into their journey? I think... Uh as I said, it, it was probably that they were all immediately skeptical about what they were hearing because it just didn't seem to make sense. Do you think it was happening. the Warren Commission? The Warren Commission, perhaps? Uh, well, you know, you got to remember the Warren Commission, uh, that, that was established about a week after the assassination, and they didn't publish anything mm -hmm. uh, for something like 10 months um, afterward. And, and all the, the, the earliest critics that I've written about were active really f almost from day one and most of them what that meant at that early point was was tracking the story in the newspaper and noting contradictions in um in some of the some of the reports that they were getting and uh and then 10 months later when the Warren Commission did publish its material, buying that and uh, and beginning their analysis of that. Can you, oh, you know, let me say one sure, thing though, before we continue. I'm sorry if I cut you off there. No, uh, no, I, no, I do no. want to distinguish, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> for the uh, sake of listeners, uh, distinguish between the single volume Warren report, mm 
which was published in uh, September of 1964, September 27th, and the 26-volume Hearings and Exhibits, which were published two months later, uh, the uh, November 23rd, 64, the day after uh, the first anniversary of the assassination. And those are that 26-volume set. I mean, they're like a, they're like a set of encyclopedias. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a massive amount of, of data, and. Um, the single volume Warren report, which was published first in September, is uh, ostensibly a summary uh, or a distillation, if you will, of that 26 volume set of hearings and exhibits, which is uh, uh, the hearings. The 26 volumes are, are the published uh, transcripts of witness testimony and uh, uh, other exhibits that were that were offered into evidence during the course of the commission's work. I should mention to younger listeners, too, who are unfamiliar with the Warren Commission, the Warren Commission was exactly that, a commission. Under the tutorship, I guess you could say, the leadership of Earl Warren. Earl Warren was the, help me out here if I'm going to be wrong, um, it's American history. <laughs> he was the, um, not the attorney general, what would you call him? He at was the, the uh, at the time of the assassination. He was the uh, the uh, justice. Uh, he was uh, he was the uh, chief justice of chief the United justice. States Supreme Thank Court. You. Thank you. So he was uh, asked by then President Johnson to put this commission together to investigate the assassination of JFK. And John just explained it took 10 months for it to come out. The results of that commission were that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. The next question I have for you is. How did these researchers begin to share their information? How did they come in in knowledge of each other? As I just said, there was no cell phones, no email, no internet, nothing. Right, and they 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 came in contact with each other in different ways. Um, it's in- interesting and useful that you mm-hmm. played a clip with Mark Lane off the top because while, uh, as I say in my book, I don't think anyone can really rightfully claim to be, quote-unquote, the first of the early critics, Mark Lane was easily, especially during the uh, that roughly one-year period between the assassination and the, and the Warren report, he was uh, easily the critic with the highest public profile. Um, and he certainly had the... Uh, the uh, the background uh, for such a role, because he was a he was a practicing uh, attorney, a defense mm-hmm. attorney, criminal defense attorney, and also a former member of the uh, New York State Assembly, which is their state legislature. Um, so uh, he um, did a couple of things. Actually, he uh, he he wrote an early article. He or actually, not a, it wasn't intended as an article, although it was published as an article. He wrote a defense brief for Lee Harvey Oswald within a week or, or two of the assassination. And uh, he sent that uh, to the Warren Commission, which had just been formed. Mm -hmm. And then he went about, uh, he set about trying to get the article published. It took him a while to do that because uh, once it became plain that the that the government was pretty much wedded to the the whole lone assassin mm. scenario uh, getting stories published um, getting dissenting opinions out there was not always easy so accessing the media was not always not always an easy thing so um Lane did manage to get his article his defense brief for Oswald published in uh the National Guardian, which, what was it? I think it was a socialist magazine. But it was essentially a, or not a magazine, but it was essentially a, a, a national newspaper. And that was in uh, December of 63, about a month after the assassination. And at that same, on the same day that that was published, the New York Times wrote an article about Lane's article. And they published that on December 18th, I think, 63. So uh, a lot of people saw that. And Mark Lane was quickly identified as as, uh, as a as a leading dissenter, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, some of the people who eventually became these first generation critics, I think, contacted um, Mark Lane uh, at his uh, office in New York, uh, and that was one of the ways that, that they came in contact with each other. Um, although I would like to digress. Sure, please. Just, just no a problem. little bit, mm-hmm. because that, that's one of the interesting um, the interesting things uh, about this. Uh, let's see. So, uh, 
after uh, the the Times uh, ran an article about Mark Lane's article, his National Guardian article, his defense brief, um, it led to one of those unplanned junctures that just make all the difference. Uh, right after the assassination, uh, a woman in a small town called Hominy, Oklahoma, named Shirley Martin, I don't think I mentioned her when I was going down the list of early critics, um, uh, she saw that article. She she subscribed to uh, the New York Times and also to, bo- to both uh, Dallas Daily newspapers right after the assassination, because she, like the others, was pretty sure that something fishy was was you know going on in Dallas. So she saw this article that the Times uh, wrote about Lane, and she clipped it out and sent it to Marguerite Oswald, the um, the mother of Lee Harvey Oswald, the alleged uh, assassin, who of course was dead by then. Mm-hmm. And Marguerite Oswald in turn contacted Lane and asked him to represent her dead son before the Warren Commission. Uh, as it happened, that that never came to pass because uh, the uh, the commission wouldn't allow it. They they uh, at first they eventually changed their mind, but at first they said that they were not going to allow Oswald any representation at all. And their justification for that was that they were not a, they were not uh, uh, it wasn't a trial. That they were doing it was an, uh, an investigation. An investigation. They, they called yeah. themselves. They called themselves. They defined themselves rather as a fact-finding agency committed to the ascertainment of truth, and that's quote unquote right out of the Warren report. I was going to say it's too bad they didn't fulfill that. And yes, find the is. truth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. But uh, you know that's that's what we're that's what we're left with. We're, we're uh, um. And uh, why we're talking this evening. There you go. You're listening to Night Fright, Wednesdays from 3 to 5 in the afternoon and from 10 until midnight at night. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. We are indeed speaking with John Kellen. John Kellen has a great book out. It's called Praise of a Future Generation. And you can get it at Amazon.com. But I checked out chapters here. Those of you listening across the world, chapters is our version of Barnes & Noble. And chapters right here on the Kingsway offers the book. So you can pick it up right there. No problem at all. And it is masterfully written. Nice job, John. Thank you. Um, it is really, you know, on a cold night like this, you get a fireplace going, off you go. Curl up in your favorite corner with this book. You will be entertained and educated all at the same time. I want to mention JFK Lancer at the same time also. JFK Lancer, L-A-N-C-E-R dot com. There you are going to find a wealth of information about the John Kennedy assassination. It is a website dedicated to the researchers early and current and all the current news on the assassination and I highly recommend I can't say that enough that you go there. There's even an online forum you can join and join in the discussions and learn more about the assassination. You're listening to CKLU 96.7 FM and www.cklu.ca on the internet. We were talking about Mark Lane and Rush to Judgment as his documentary. What type of persecution did he face in terms of people discrediting him, things of, of that nature? Did Mark Lane face? Yes, yeah. Well, persecution, that's a pretty loaded word. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. Let's, uh, let's think for a second. You're talking about at the time that... that well, he that, came out with it. You know, he challenged the, the Warren Commission finding this um, revered government body of all these reputable people. And he came out and said, whoa, 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 wait a second. You know, you haven't done your job. You haven't looked at the witnesses. What kind of repercussions did he face because of his his point of view? Right. Um, this is one of those things that uh, I guess you can never you can never uh, prove it uh, in the sense of proving something that would stand up in a court of law. But some pretty strange things did happen hmm. to uh, to Mark Lane. He, uh, as I said, attempted to uh, to represent Oswald before the Warren Commission and. The Warren Commission uh, didn't allow that, um, although they subsequently appointed a man named Walter Craig to to represent Oswald's interests. Craig, uh, Walter Craig, was at that time the uh, the I think it was president or executive executive director. I think president was the was the term, but he was the head of the American Bar Association. And by m- most uh, accounts, uh, he really 
he really was just sort of there uh, as a as a as a body, but he didn't really do anything. You know, he he didn't really raise any any uh, any kind of defense for for Oswald as the commission did its work. So anyway, uh, once uh, Lane was was uh, denied uh, the uh, the uh, denied be, uh, going before the commission as Oswald's mm-hmm. uh, defense, he launched his own investigation uh, into the into the assassination and, and surrounding events. And in the spring of uh, 1964, some four or five months after the assassination, he established an organization he called the Committee, uh, the Citizens Committee of Inquiry, and uh, that was a purely a voluntary, a volunteer organization that uh, was going to uh, do its own uh, independent investigation into, into the facts surrounding the case. And also keep the keep the matter before the public. Um, so around the time that Lane was in fact out there snooping around and asking a lot of questions, and he also launched uh, uh, went on a very ambitious speaking tour. He spoke regularly in New York City, and uh, for the first few months after the assassination, and then went on a sort of a college campus mm-hmm. uh, junket, and uh, even spoke as far away as as, uh, as Europe. Um, after he was uh, snooping around and asking some some uh, some questions, uh, some, some kind of strange things did happen to him. He was he recounts this in one of his books how he left his house one morning uh, off to the office and was out on the sidewalk to hail a taxi, and a couple of men <laughs> just approached him out of nowhere. They weren't muggers; they were they uh, flashed uh, FBI credentials and said they wanted to talk to him and. And uh, Lane said, you can't do this in the middle of the street and, and managed to evade them and get away. But he was convinced that he was being was being harassed. Hmm. He also, uh, like one it. of the times he was coming back from Europe, uh, he was given flack uh, at, at, uh, at uh, one of the airports. The airport, I think, yeah. yes. He was coming in and showing uh, his... his his, he was briefly detained. His mm-hmm. passport was taken away from him. You know, he was allowed to continue on his way after a while. But it was it was this very definite uh, harassment that was that was it was uh, he was undergoing. We're coming up to the bottom of the hour. Do you want to take a break? You want to keep going? I'll... No, it's your show. Oh. You know, we can keep going if you want. Okay, that's great. Um, I always leave it up to the guest. If you want to take a break at any point, just let me know, and I'll uh, play some music, and we'll take a break. If you want to get a, a glass of water, a cup of coffee, uh, whatever. You're listening to Night Fright, Wednesdays from 3 to 5 in the afternoon, and from 10 until midnight at night. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. We are speaking with John Kellen. John Kellen has a great book out called Praise from a Future Generation. The book is available at Chapters. It's 600 pages. Don't expect to get through it all in one shot, but it's full of little tidbits that even I didn't know. Not that I'm an expert on the JFK assassination, but I've read a bunch of books, and this was a little interesting observation. I had no idea. We're talking about Mark Lane. He believed that in the Time Life magazine photo of Oswald holding a rifle was faked. Strangely enough, unbeknownst to Lane, Oswald had said the same thing when Oswald was being interrogated. They both believed that that photo had been faked. Here's two independent people, never talked with each other, came to the same conclusion. I just thought that was fascinating. And indeed, when you look at the picture, I uh, recommend everybody Google it. Just look for... um, Lee Harvey Oswald time life picture. And you'll be able to tell that uh, the picture has been cropped right at the chin. You can see the crop mark. The shadow lines don't fall correctly, etc., etc. I thought, you know, this book is really good for things like that. I had no idea. And it really does give a great history. Another thing I had no idea about, I had mentioned in the beginning, Harold Weisberg is one of my heroes. And he was originally in the OSS, which was the precursor, if I'm not mistaken, to the CIA. He wasn't really in the OSS in, in the sense of being a an, an agent. agent. His uh, his official title was intelligence analyst, and uh, uh, never really got a clear. I interviewed Harold a number of occasions, and never got a real clear picture of exactly what it was he did. But he was not mm-hmm. not a spook in that in the usual sense of the in the E. Howard Hunt sense. 
Yeah. Yeah. Can we just jump into a little bit about his story and, you know, the whole thing about uh, the Red Scare and, and some anti-Semitism he experienced? Yeah, he was, uh, he, uh, he had a pretty varied career. He, he uh, early on had a, had a government job. He was um, uh, uh, an investigator with uh, the La Follette Committee, the uh, as that was informally known, and the actual name of that committee. This was during the 1930s. Was uh, they were they were investigating investigating um, uh, labor unions. And, That's right. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, attempts uh, by by big business to to crush organized labor. Uh, essentially, it's that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's what the La Follette Committee. Uh, what was the name of that committee? This is, uh, the formal name of it. Uh, it's actually a subcommittee. Oh, that's okay. Uh, we, we get the idea anyways. That's cool. Yeah. So he was an investigator for that uh, for a couple of years, and uh, later on was a magazine writer, still in the 1930s. And uh, when World War II broke out, he joined the army and uh, was uh, uh, hospitalized with, I think he said the mumps. He told me it was the mumps, but that also... Uh, 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 disclosed or, or revealed some additional physical problems that he had, so he was, they gave him a desk job, I guess, in in, uh, in uh, the OSS as a, became an intelligence analyst. And uh, and eventually, when the after the, when the war ended, the OSS was disbanded, and he was moved over to the State Department. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was uh, uh, fired um, along with several others in uh, um, the. The grounds on that, I think, officially were some. Uh, there was. Uh, I wish I'd known this question was going to come up. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> it's gone over my notes. Oh, sorry. Um, no, no. Okay, I, um, it's no problem. I think it was because uh, him and a group of others were considered to be subversive in a sense that there was a red scare going on. Of course, McCarthy. Well, that was that was part of it, and I'm trying yeah. to remember exactly what what brought that all on. But uh, Weisberg was always convinced that that it was really anti-Semitism was the was the Most real reason it. that That's he was right. fired. Yeah, because he and I think there was eight or nine others who I guess were all Jewish, mm-hmm. and then they were all. They were all fired, so they they uh, banded together and to they, fight it. Uh, right, they banded together. They got themselves a powerful uh, Washington attorney, and they they sued or they they fought back. I don't know if it was, it probably wasn't a lawsuit, but uh, and, and they weren't really trying to get their jobs back. They were actually just trying to be able to uh, to resign with without this stigma of of being fired and having this this. Um, this leftist brand on their on their permanent records, especially um, in that era, and they won. They won their case. which is important, essential. Actually, can you just tell the folks who, who aren't familiar with McCarthyism, maybe a Reader's Digest version in a couple of minutes of what McCarthyism was, just so they know? Yeah, uh, McCarthyism. It, it's associated with Joseph McCarthy, uh, the senator, Wisconsin yeah. senator, but it really you know goes beyond. Uh, it, it, before uh, McCarthy latched onto that is, is his issue, um, and it was uh, it was uh, essentially purging anybody uh, with leftist uh, political views from from uh, the government. I think it started in the State Department, and uh, uh, there was a, a guy named Carl Marzani was one of the first uh, victims of it. Um, Marzani was uh, also a, he had a career similar to uh, or, or not unlike Harold Weisberg. He was in, in uh, the State Department and um, was uh, accused of, of uh, yeah, my memory's uh, <laughs> slipping on the no, it's head. okay. But he was, he was one, yeah. he, I think he was the first, uh, the first uh, government employee that was uh, accused of, of being a communist and was actually imprisoned for uh, two or three years uh, in the late 40s and early 50s. Mm-hmm. Or that is an interesting case because he went on to um, become a small publisher and uh, after the Kennedy assassination, he published several uh, pretty important um, early works uh, relating to the assassination, uh, in, including uh, a book by a, a uh, naturalized American citizen, a German uh, by birth, uh, man named uh, Joachim Josten. I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly, or more or less correctly. Josten wrote a book called Oswald, Assassin, or Fall Guy. And that was actually published before, uh, before the Warren Commission was out. So it was an extremely early work based mostly on uh, newspaper articles and that sort of thing, and the publisher of that, as I said, as I got on on that, was was Carl Marzani, who was like Weisberg, was victimized in this in this uh, red 
uh, scare, this communist hysteria uh, of the of the early fifties that was really intent on on purging uh, and, and originally the State Department and, and other 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 government agencies. The entertainment uh, industry also. Anyone suspected you know, of being, uh, you know, a, a, a communist sort of yeah. <laughs> communist, yeah. <laughs> a pinko, as Archie Bunker would say. You're listening to Night Fright, Wednesdays from 3 to 5 in the afternoon and from 10 until midnight at night. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, Harold Weisberg's life in terms of what got him started on the road that he took in terms of investigating and making his conclusions, which I think were absolutely stunning, especially for the time and given the resources available to him uh, about the Kennedy assassination? Yeah. Uh, uh, he uh, Well, after he was... Uh, uh drummed out of the uh, out of government service he uh, had a rather uh, abrupt or radical career change he uh, established a poultry farm in maryland and he ran that for 10 or 12 years and was actually in the process of shutting that down at the time of the assassination um and he was thinking about he, he always contended that his farm was ruined by by uh, military helicopters that flew over his land and i guess it <laughs> made the, the case crazy or something like that, um, and just ruined his 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 his, uh, his whole entire operation. So he was shutting that down, and he said uh, he was planning. He told me he was planning on returning to his his writing career, which he'd done many years earlier. Mm-hmm. And he was actually planning on writing a book about the dangers of of excessive noise, which he contended ruined his farm. Um, and that's what he was thinking about, and I guess making some initial outlines and drafts on uh when when kennedy was killed and um he like in common with the other uh of these first generation critics that i've written about was immediately skeptical about the story coming out of dallas it it just didn't smell right to him Mm. and um after oswald was killed and he was convinced that that something was wrong so he's said that he decided to do what he had done professionally and went as an intelligence analyst in the OSS and analyzed the government's report when it came out. So I guess he completed shutting down his farm during the period between uh, the assassination and the appearance of the Warren report. And also, like the others, he, you know, he kept, uh, kept track of the story as it was, pol- as it was reported in the media, which uh, really was not... I mean, it was mostly the uh, the uh, the government uh, accounts that were that were in the in the newspapers at that time. So not a whole lot of really good information. Um, and then when the Warren report was published in September of 1964, he bought a copy of that and and the 26 volumes two months later, and uh, began to analyze it. And um, his he told me that his major conclusion was he was of course certain that there was conspiracy but there was nothing in the volumes or in the in the published data that allowed him to say with certainty exactly what did happen you can show from the evidence the official evidence what didn't happen but you can't show what did happen his major conclusion was that that all institutions failed uh, the the government the 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 media academia, they all failed in their response uh, to the Kennedy assassination. Did he have a reason why he felt that way? Did he ever well, cite to you a reason, you know, a specific reason at all, why he felt yeah, that I way? Yeah, I think it was because it's, it's because the official data is so demonstrably false, mm-hmm. in a nutshell. And, you know, as, as he, I should mention, and I haven't yet, that uh, he wrote... Uh, he wrote about this in a series of books that you seem to be very familiar with. Whitewash. Uh, the first one was called Whitewash, and then they were all bore similar titles: mm-hmm. Whitewash Two and Photographic Whitewash. Whitewash and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Some similar other accounts. I recommend them too. Uh, I'm not quite sure where you can get them these days, but it's pretty again, hard to come by. You can. Yeah. There's a pretty good website, a used book website, um, called. Um, 
Yeah, when things kind of come up unexpectedly, I, I yeah, it's okay. Is, is it um, uh, Winarski's? Uh, no, but he he would be a good resource also. Yeah, Andy Winarski, uh, the last bookshop in Pennsylvania. Um, and I, I don't know his phone number off the top of my head, but he does have a website, Last okay. Hurrah Bookshop. But just do a, a Google search for those folks if you're interested in those books. They're very good. Yeah, very they can be found. Book. They can be found in libraries also. They were, they were, I think, republished. Uh, there was a really real resurgence of, of interest in a lot of this material after the Oliver Stone movie in the early 1990s. And I think, although Harold Weisberg was uh, forced by circumstances to self-publish his earliest books. Um, I think they were brought out by, it was a Carolyn Graff, they were, they were brought out by uh, a, 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 a commercial publisher uh, after the Stone movie. So they're, they're out there. They they're out there, yeah. He was instrumental also in leading Freedom of Information Act lawsuits. And he was yes, quite that, successful. that's one of the things I think that he was most proud of also. Um, that's one of the things that really makes me admire him, that he went through and persevered through all that as a private citizen. Right. And the reason that he did that was because although when I say that the Warren Commission published this 26-volume set of hearings and exhibits, it's a lot of information. Uh, I think Weisberg estimated there were, it was more than 10 million words or something just, just staggering like that. But in spite of that fact, it's still only a fraction of of the material that was gathered uh, during the uh, uh, the official investigation, which was carried out mainly by the FBI yeah, in this in the United States. Um, I, by one estimate, I think there was something. What was it? Uh, some stag, like 300 cubic feet. Or wow. How much can it be that much? Some huge amount, just vast amount of, of material that was classified and that most researchers were unable to get at um, in during the 60s and 70s. And that was the reason why Weisberg was forced to use the Freedom of Information Act to get at certain documents um, with varying degrees of success. So in, even though there's a, this huge amount of material in the official published evidence, um, he, he obtained many millions of pages beyond that, um, just through his use of the, uh, the Freedom of Information mm -hmm. Act. And most of it was stored in his basement um, in, just a, I don't know how many there were, because I was never down there, but uh, many, many metal file cabinets uh, uh, of data. Uh, those, since uh, Weisberg's death in 2002, have been transferred to Hood College, which is in Frederick, Maryland, uh, near where he lived. And uh, there's a guy in, uh, I think he lives in Idaho, uh, named Clay Ogilvie, who has been digitizing much of this material. Um, I saw Clay in November, a few months ago, when I was in Dallas. He was there for uh, one, of the, one of the conferences that were going on. And he told me at that time that he's almost done. I think he said the end is in sight. Wow. So he's, he's just digitized just this vast amount oh, yeah. of material that, yeah. that Harold Weisberg obtained over, over a number of years. And exactly what's going to happen with it, whether it will be in the form of PDF files via the Internet, I do not know. Yeah, maybe uh, so he'll I put shouldn't it in. speak to that. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, I think that there's, there's something uh, in the not-too-distant future, a, a new resource is going to be uh, available. Maybe he'll put it up on the Mary Farrell website. Uh, yeah, I don't Who know whether there we'll it will be. You know, there'll be a link between those two. Uh, not an internet link, but a, a connection between mm -hmm. organizations. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, or I understand. Not. But yeah. I'm not sure what's gonna exactly uh, how that's gonna play out. But you're listening to Night Fright Wednesdays from three to five in the afternoon and from ten until midnight at night. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. You're listening to CKLU 96.7, and the show is called Night Fright. I'm your host, Brent Holland. You can reach us on the internet anywhere in the world, folks. I was over in Istanbul a few weeks ago, and indeed, you can get it even in Istanbul. You can't get YouTube. It's censored in Turkey, but you can get CKLU. www.cklu.ca and just hit the streaming link. We are speaking with John Kellen. John Kellen has a terrific book out called In Praise from a Future Generation. And it's Praise all about, from a Future Generation. Yep. It's all about 
first generation JFK researchers. Now, what's unique about this group of researchers, as I keep coming back to say, there was no emails. You know, you just didn't CC people. There was no texting because there was no cell phones. There was no cell phones. Communication was completely different back then. As I alluded to before, if you wanted to make a long-distance phone call, it was really prohibitively expensive, especially for any length of time. There was no faxes, nothing of that nature. So the fact that these people were able to do what they did at that time is tantamount to a miracle in a sense. Can I speak to that a little bit? Absolutely, please do. Jump yeah, right I, I started. To, I got a little sidetracked. We were talking a little bit earlier about how, how these some of these critics came in contact with each other. Yeah, and I mentioned uh, how, how many of them came in contact uh, through Mark Lane's office. That's right. Yeah, and a lot of them heard about him first when there was this uh, article that was in the New York Times in December of 1963. This article that was about his defense brief for Oswald. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and subsequently, he uh, established uh, his Citizens Committee of Inquiry. Uh, another way that that these people discovered each other, that the, the, these like-minded uh, skeptics, yeah. if you will, mm-hmm. was um, a uh, class that was taught at what at the time was called the New School for Social Research in New York City. I think it's called the uh, New School University nowadays. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when that change and happened and what it means in terms of its accreditation and all that stuff. But in uh, 64, they were called the New School for Social Research. And in their winter 65 term, beginning that January, there was a, a Warren Report class uh, that was taught. And Warren Report had just been out for a few months at that time. And uh, somehow they very quickly got together this uh, this class, and it was taught by a lawyer by the name of uh, Joe Lobenthal, and he told me that it, uh, it was his idea. He said he just well, you know this this he was really interested in the assassination, but he thought there's just so much material between the Warren report and these 26 lives. How can anybody possibly digest that in a really rapid way. And he thought, well, maybe if I had a class, and, and it was the subject of the class, you know, with, with a whole mm-hmm. lot of minds uh, getting, putting uh, putting their heads together, we can uh, make some progress in that area. So he did this class. And uh, that was, uh, some of the people that came out of that class, one of the most important, probably the most important, a woman named Sylvia Marr, <laughs> who... Uh, you I, must I be clairvoyant. Because uh, that was exactly my next statement yeah, <laughs> we was, were going to get into was, her. Yeah. Like, like Mark Lane, she lived in New York, mm-hmm. and she was a an international civil servant. She worked at the World Health Organization. Did I mention this earlier? That uh, was an agency of the uh, United Nations. Um, no, you didn't, actually. No. Okay. And uh, she, um, well, like the others, was immediately skeptical of... Uh, of uh, the, the Warren Report story coming out of Dallas and right. the, the story that Lee Harvey Oswald had acted alone and uh, she bought the Warren Report when it first came out or earlier in fact she uh, she attended uh, she read all the articles the few that were there anyway but she attended the uh, Mark Lane lectures in New York and uh, uh, bought the Warren Report when it was published and wrote a quick analysis of it and tried to get that published and didn't meet any success um, doing that, and then kind of shifted gears when the 26 volumes were published in November of 1964. And then she heard about this class that was being offered at the New School for Social Research, uh, and she took it. And so uh, she was in this class, and there was another guy in that class, and his name is Stuart Gallander. He was also a, he was subsequently a a uh, volunteer with Mark Lane's uh, Citizens Committee of Inquiry. And a few others, like Thomas Stamm was in that class, uh, other people who uh, maintained an association after the class ended in, uh, I think, in probably March or April. So that was another way that some of these people um, came in contact with each other through this class. Mm-hmm. The, the class also, interestingly enough, got uh, a mention, I think it was in Newsweek, because either Time or Newsweek, I kind of mix them up sometimes, and they're practically interchangeable anyway. Um, there was a, a very brief mention of, of uh, this class at the New School, and uh, that further got it some attention. A woman in uh, Beverly Hills, Maggie Field, I think I mentioned her, mm-hmm. saw mm-hmm. this you little did. blurb about the... Uh, 
the class, and she wrote to Joe Lobenthal, the guy that was the instructor. And uh, that is how she came in contact with Sylvia Marr. They later became very close friends uh, and were in regular contact for several years, um, sharing information. So that was just another one of the ways that, that people came in contact with each other. Um, Okay. If you don't, don't mind my con continuing a monologue. Or, no, uh, no, 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 please. <laughs> no, no, please. The important thing is uh, to get the information out there to the folks. Just to let you know, we are speaking with John Kellen. John's got a great book available at Chapters. It is called Phrase From, from a, a Future, future Generation. generation. I'm getting a little warmed up now, so I tend to kind of start talking, and it's hard for me to shut up sometimes. No, no, please, Once please. I get uh, started. We got two hours, my friend. Keep going. Don't worry. And, uh, you know, if, if we run out of time, come back. Okay. <laughs> it's no problem because there's you know a plethora of researchers who are so important that, that their story gets told and I think this is what's important about your book is it's of historical value because some of these folks have passed on though I know Harold Weisberg has these are individual people and this is what's so great about the researchers in general you're an individual person you don't work for an agency or anything and you just do this out of love of patriotism love of country and I think this is what was inspiring about all these stories that are in your book because they did the same thing. They said, no, something's wrong here, and I'm going to challenge this. And they did it by themselves. And I find that very inspiring. I find those stories, and they're true stories. I find that very inspiring indeed. And we're speaking uh, about Sylvia Meyer right now. Now, what, what was the main thing that she did that was so important about the uh, Warren Commission books that wasn't well, available? Sylvia Meyer really, in, in my view, has two major published works. Mm -hmm. Um one of them is her analysis, uh, or she always called it a comparative study, uh, between the single-volume Warren Report and the 26-volume set of hearings and exhibits. She did a comparative study to see whether the facts that were presented in the Warren Report, which was uh, sort of everywhere when it was first published, whether they really did follow from the uh, evidence that was in the 26 volumes, which were not a, a widely available uh, set of books. Mm -hmm. When the Warren Report, it was published by by the government printing office in the United States, uh, and, and so that was, a, sort of, that was sort of an official version, and it was also published by four, or was it five, uh, let's, let's say four commercial publishers, so it was readily available everywhere in mass market paperbacks, and as if that weren't enough, it was also the complete text of the single volume Warren report was published in the New York Times the day after uh, it was it was first published by the government, so it would have been you know, like September 28th or something, 64. So, okay. you know, simply stated, when the Warren Report came out, I mean, it was just everywhere. It just permeated <laughs> uh, the uh, <laughs> the American public, and the world for that matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it also got a great deal of attention from the major media, in particular CBS and, and Time Life. Um, so what that means then is that the government's single vo single gunman theory was just got was just widely widely uh, distributed and it was really the only story going for for a, a long time and most people did not see the 26 volumes of hearings and exhibits they were, they were from, for one thing they would, just weren't that readily available and for another they were published a couple months after the uh, Warren report which mm -hmm. was everywhere so a handful of critics, including Sylvia Marr, also bought the 26 volumes when they were made available, and they began comparing the, the conclusions of uh, the single volume Warren report to the evidence that, you know, you see your footnote there, you turn to your 26 volumes and say, well, does it really say that? And uh, which might sound like a fairly simple thing to do, but uh, uh, it, it wasn't. And so Sylvia Marr did this uh, this comparative study. She always called it a comparative study, and it was published in 1967 as Accessories After the Fact. And so I think that's one of her real major uh, contributions to our understanding of the Kennedy assassination. Yeah, I agree um, with you. And I, I, for my money, I, I really think that it's probably the uh, the best book that was produced by any of the uh, the uh, early critics. Um, 
her other her other um, bit major contribution might sound a little odd. It was a actually a, a subject index when the um, commission published uh, its. 26 volume set of hearings and exhibits, it did include a name index, but there was no subject index. And the name index, see, there were 26 volumes. The first mm-hmm. 15 of those, the first 15 of those volumes are the witness testimony. And this, the name index covers most of the names that are in those. But the remaining 11 volumes are all photographs and, and, and transcripts of various uh, interviews and uh, um, uh, other data that's of the, of the, of, that was entered into evidence. Um, and that stuff is, is, uh, was not indexed by the, by the commission. Um, let's see if I can find this on my notes. Sylvia actually had a pretty good... I call her Sylvia like I know her. She's a friend of mine. Um, she had a pretty good uh, comment about that. Uh, she actually wrote this in Accessories After the Fact. She said that uh, finding information in the 26 volumes was like searching mm-hmm. for information in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Mm-hmm. The contents were untitled, unalphabetized, and in random sequence. I love that quote. Yeah. So yeah. They, were, they were really, they were very poorly organized. Whether that was deliberate or not is a matter of speculation. Um, Harold Weisberg, incidentally, called called it organized chaos. That was that was his <laughs> description of the, of the organization of the twenty six volumes. So Sylvia Marr had, by the time she. Uh, she uh, saw that or was coming to this conclusion about the state of the uh, organization of the 26th volume. She'd al- already begun her comparative study, but she decided it was important enough to draw some sort of order out of this chaos that she set aside her work on the, um, the comparative study and began working on a, on a subject index. And this was done the old-fashioned way, you know, certainly without any kind of you know, personal computer to help you out. It was yeah. just done on index cards, right. I, I would imagine. No Excel and, files uh, in. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it took about a, a year and a half, I think, and, and she produced a, uh, a subject index, a very uh, comprehensive subject index to this material that really is uh, pretty much an indispensable tool for anyone who wants to delve into this stuff, this, m- <laughs> this mass of uh, poorly organized data. And uh, it was actually published in uh, 1966 by Scarecrow Press, and it's got the very simple title, uh, Subject Index to the Warren Report. It's not available anymore. Uh, anybody who wants to find it, uh, good luck. Uh, <laughs> and be ready to pay for it when you do mm. find it. Uh, although I think you can probably get a copy, uh, photocopies of that from the uh, National Archives. I think they have it. Uh, um, but uh, anyway, um, so that was that was her other major major contribution. Probably not as well known as as accessories after the fact, which itself is not terribly well known to most of us today. Um, she was she's one of the very impressive uh, individual. You're listening to Night Fright. Wednesdays from 3 to 5 in the afternoon and from 10 until midnight at night. Your voice in the dark for Paranormal and Conspiracy Radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. In 1961, in the book, you wrote that local authorities allowed the KKK to attack the Freedom Riders. I don't know if you remember this little antidote or not. Yeah. Uh, Unimpaired for 15 whole minutes and J. Edgar Mm -hmm. Hoover didn't tell RFK. I felt this was important because I think people growing up today, I think they'd be shocked to learn about the animosity between the Kennedy administration, the CIA and the FBI. The CIA and FBI really didn't listen to the Kennedy administration and were kind of almost a government on their own. Part of this animosity that was going on was definitely about the Freedom Riders. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that whole era. You cover a little bit of Medgar Evans, a little bit about Martin Luther King's Freedom Riders. Could you just give us a brief synopsis just to let people know what was going on in that era? Yeah, I I originally decided to put some of that material in uh, just for historical context. Exactly. Um, That was my original thought. But it's funny how those things work because, you you know, you start delving into things and then you, you get to 
six degrees of separation. <laughs> exactly. you know, it, it started seeming to me like, God, this stuff, it all sort of comes together, you know, and, and not mm-hmm. even, maybe not even six steps, you know, not just two or three. It's pretty scary. And yeah. uh, as I, much of my book was based on, not all of it certainly, but much of it was based on the personal correspondence that uh, these people we rem- remember as critics uh, left behind that I was able to obtain. Some of it I got uh, from a lawyer in, in Philadelphia named Vince Salandria, mm-hmm. who was another of the early critics and who I met about uh, 10 years ago in Dallas. Yeah, and, and I'd like to uh, talk about him too, uh, yeah. maybe in a half an hour or so. Right. And so I, I started also. you know, seeing references to, it became, it became clear to me through the references I was seeing in, in much of this correspondence that as much as these these people these critics were interested in the uh, assassination. Well, they were also, not surprisingly, they were interested in the other current events of the day. So that that seemed to justify my looking into uh, uh, the civil rights movement, which is probably uh, you know just as just as major an event uh, of that era as, as the Kennedy assassination was. Um, the Freedom Riders that you mentioned, uh, I think that began in. Uh, those began in early 1960s, probably was 61, like you said. Um, and what that was, was, uh, and here again, I'm, my memory's going to fall a little short on me. I, I don't know if I, I can't really quote this chapter in verse, but they That's were okay. testing a federal law that I believe uh, 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 banned um, discrimination in interstate travel. I think was the what the official law was, and even though that was the federal law, the law of the land, as we would say, it was in practice ignored by your southern redneck types. Mm-hmm. Um, if you'll pardon that that uh, no, no, it's stereotype. Fine, it's fine. Um, so the uh, people that uh, we recall as the Freedom Riders it actually begun. What was that guy's name? Um, Shoot, uh, James. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh heck, um, I, I'm I'm drawing a blank on this guy's name. But, That's okay. Uh, it, was uh, he part of the uh, the um, civil rights movement, or was he? Oh yeah, uh, James Farmer. James Farmer, I think it was. Okay. Um, I think that's right. Uh, he uh, and, and his organization. I'm drawing a blank on that too, Brent. You're really NACCP. NAA? No, no, it was he was he was uh, it was a different different. Anyway, it really doesn't matter. He he, he it, it the the original Freedom Rides began, I think, in in Washington D.C., which is technically the South Southern United States, and they 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 were just testing this law. They were, they were going to ride on buses over state lines, so it would be interstate travel. And they, you know, do it in a non-segregated way, and uh, it's just one of those really. It developed into one of those really appalling um, uh, scenes. Several, more than one, uh, where they were in different stops along the way. They were attacked, and the buses were bombed, were firebombed. People were beaten, and uh, it's just one of those really appalling, incomprehensible um, events of that of that time and uh you alluded to uh the uh the beatings that happened and i don't remember now and i don't want to name a a city because if i name it wrong it will be uh, embarrassing but um where there was there they knew that these this bus this this integrated bus these freedom riders were coming to this particular stop and there was an agreement (laughs) where the authorities agreed not to intervene for about 15 minutes and just let these Klansmen types just brutalize these these Freedom Riders. And uh, it was just uh, pretty in, pretty incredible. It's just hard to believe that, that something like that could even happen. But it really, uh, you know, the, uh, the resulting publicity, of course, it... Uh, it, it, it helped the federal government get or forced the federal government to get into the act or to enforce what that law of the land you know what it was um, 
So and J. Edgar Hoover wasn't too, which was the head of the FBI at the time, wasn't too keen on enforcing it. No, he's not. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering your your question. You did because I guess what I'm trying to say is you masterfully put us right in the '60s. I felt like I was right there again. I mean, I was only a kid. I was so, around then too. I was a kid. Yeah, I was just a kid, but I do remember, you know, Martin Luther King uh, being alive and JFK. I certainly do remember the day he was killed, even though I was just a kid. One of my first memories, actually. I guess what I'm saying is the book is very very good at putting you right in a period. It gives you a very good idea of what was going on, not just the JFK assassination, but what was also influencing the thought of intellectuals at the time. And that'll lead me to another question. What were the intellectuals thinking? And I'm not talking about the researchers now. I'm talking about people, for example, who could have done something. The Cronkites, the Walter Cronkites. Oh, uh, I don't know if Walter Cronkite would, qu- would qualify <laughs> as an intellectual. <laughs> How about Arthur Schlesinger, Ted Sorensen, uh, Bobby Kennedy, Teddy Kennedy? I'm still perplexed. I, mean, I always have been perplexed, although I do understand that Ted Sorensen sort of believes now and that indeed there was people who, have, who murdered John F. Kennedy. It was a conspiracy. But I was always perplexed why Teddy Kennedy, for example, never followed suit, even in the 70s, the 80s, and even today, with some sort of investigation. Any idea what these people were thinking at the time? No. And, you know, that, that get, gets into a, an area of, of total speculation. You know, uh, what do they say? Kennedys don't cry. Kennedys, mm-hmm. are, they're, they're, they're part of the system, and, and uh, they're, they're players, and they're insiders. And I think that anything that they might do that that would be a reaction to uh, or or somehow acting on their own suspicions or uh, what they think really happened um, would not be anything that would get any kind of publicity. I I really believe that, and I'm Mm -hmm. not sure that makes any sense. um, Okay, but I don't think that that was speculation, and that's speculation, so that's great. You want to jump into Vince Salandria? Sure. We'll talk about him. Yeah, um, and this will we can t- maybe tie a few things together. Vince sure. Calandria, as I mentioned, was uh, uh, an early critic that uh, I happened to meet uh, about ten years ago. And uh, the time I met him, I thought it was just a, a lucky thing. I thought it was pretty cool. I, by some fluke, I met Michael Jordan, the basketball player, that same year, a couple of months before I met Vince. And I thought Vince, meeting right Vince, was way cooler. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was he really by at that stage was sort of this legendary uh, almost mythic uh, figure because mm-hmm. he, he you know he was pretty active in the early 60s but he you know he was not anybody I ever expected to meet and uh, um, uh, anyway uh-huh. we, uh, I thought it was just a one shot deal we exchanged business cards he gave me a copy of his speech at a website at the time called Fair Play hmm. magazine it was all about the Kennedy assassination. And he gave me a copy of the speech that he delivered. That was at the uh, COPA conference that year in Dallas. And uh, he may have been at the Lancer conference, too. I'm not sure. He, uh, anyway, it's beside the point. I I met him. He gave me a copy of the speech. We exchanged business cards. I went home from Dallas back to Colorado and scanned in the speech, put it on my website. And I thought that was that. But he called me a few months later and said he'd seen it and thought it looked pretty good and said some nice things about fair play and we kept in touch and uh, a year or so after I met him he offered me all this correspondence that that uh, that dated back to the 60s his, his assassination related correspondence and I accepted it and uh, it became much of the raw material that uh, I developed into my book now in the early 60s or at the time of the assassination mm-hmm. Flandria uh, well, he's always ha- always has uh, been a lawyer. Um, he was a volunteer lawyer for the uh, American Civil Liberties Union, and also had a, some did some private practice uh, work. And he was also a uh, high school social studies teacher. Um, uh, after the assassination, he uh, he's always been keenly interested in uh, in world affairs. He and his brother-in-law, uh, another Harold, a, a writer named Harold Feldman. Um, really worked together mm-hmm. for the first, uh, in, in the initial months or initial year or so. Um, they uh, both researched, and Harold Feldman wrote an article called Oswald and the FBI, and that was published um, in one of the rare uh, publications uh, to accept an article like this in The Nation in January of 1964. 
And then a few months later, in the spring of 1964, that was the time that uh, Mark Lane had established the Citizens Committee of Inquiry. And uh, uh, Vince uh, Slandria and Harold Feldman both were associated with that. Um, in the summer of 1964, they, as volunteers, they both, uh, Harold and uh, Vince, traveled to Dallas together to uh, to uh, interview uh, as many witnesses as they could find. Uh, they had a number of contacts that they were given from through Mark Lane's office of people to contact in Dallas. Um, so uh, they went to Dallas on behalf of Lane's committee uh, to interview witnesses. And one of the first things that they did was meet up with Marguerite Oswald, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's mother. Right, yeah. And they met with her over a couple of days. They visited Helen Markham, who was the uh, Warren Commission star witness against uh, Tippett, Oswald yeah. for the murder of a Dallas police officer named J.D. Tippett. And they came away from meeting Helen Markham just convinced that she had been threatened and, and ordered not to talk. It's really... It's kind of spooky because Slandria just vividly, all these years later, can still recall that Helen Markham, he told me, was so terrified that her teeth uh, yeah. were literally chattering. Mm -hmm. And she was just saying, go away. You know, I, I don't want to talk to you. Um, and he told me, Vince told me, that he had never seen that kind of terror before. Um, they also interviewed uh, uh, a woman named Aquila Clemens. And... Uh, at the top of your show, you played that clip um, of, from Mark Lane's uh, film, Rush, Rush to Judgment. Judgment. Mm -hmm. Right, that was the sort of the film version of his book. I think it was, much of it was shot, the interviews were shot in probably the summer of 65, and it was the film was out about a year later. Um, and at the very end of this film is uh, uh, this filmed interview with this woman, Aquila Clements, who was a witness although not an eyewitness, to the uh, murder of, of Officer Tippett. Mm -hmm. um, before Lane ever interviewed her for that film, several of the uh, Citizens Committee volunteers acting on Lane's behalf uh, traveled to Dallas, and she was M Mrs. Clemens was among those that were interviewed. Uh, Vince and uh, Vince Landry and, and Feldman both interviewed her, Although unfortunately, there is uh, there's no record of that. I, I keep seeing references in some of Salandria's letters to tapes, but if there were, if he ever had any tapes, they were lost. Unfortunately, oh. I, never, I was never able to obtain any of those. I would love to have found something yeah. like that. That would have been great. So even though there was no record of it, uh, Salandria will say to this day that 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 uh, Aquila Clemens was, in his view, was a credible a credible witness. Mm -hmm. Although it does appear like Helen Markham, she was threatened and told not to talk. Um, there were other committee volunteers, Citizens Committee volunteers, besides Slandria and Feldman, who contacted her that summer of 1964, including a couple of uh, Columbia University graduate students named George and Pat Nash, and then uh, the Oklahoma woman, woman that I mentioned a little while ago, Shirley Martin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The Nashes, as it happened, were not impressed with Aquila Clemens. And let's see on my notes here. They wrote that her account that she gave of the Tibet killing was rather vague, and she may have based her story on secondhand accounts of others at the scene, unquote. Uh, they wrote about that in an article that was published in, I think, The New Leader in September of 1964. But unfortunately, they did not say why they doubted her, which is... I wonder if I tried to find George and Pat Nash, and if they... Mm -hmm. I couldn't find him. I mean, I'm not. I'm no Sherlock Holmes. I'd give him my best shot, but uh, I couldn't. I couldn't find them when I was in the research phase of my own book. Maybe she gave that answer because she had been threatened, so she wanted to be vague purposely to try and protect herself. Uh, possibly, but uh, the interesting thing is that what I did find, um, Shirley Martin, the Oklahoma woman, did speak to Mrs. Clemens to Aquila Clemens in August of 1964, and that was about a month I was able to determine, about a month after Slandria and the Feldmans and the Nashes all talked to her. And uh, Shirley Martin, um, actually her daughter was with her, Shirley Martin's daughter was with her, and they, they, she, her daughter had a tape recorder that was hidden in her purse, and they taped it. Mm -hmm. They taped the interview. I didn't get a copy of the tape, but I did. They, there wasn't a transcript of the tape, and... and um, 
I did get a copy of that. Would you like me to hear, <laughs> hear a little bit about that? Sure, please. Yeah, that, that was a great little story, actually. Okay, yeah. So in their conversation, uh, Mrs. Clemens gives all these reasons why she doesn't want to talk to, to Shirley Martin that mm-hmm. day. But uh, after some prodding, she did describe seeing two men, neither of whom were Oswald, in the vicinity of the Tippett killing. And it was right after it happened. And I should mention that the Tippett killing is important for a couple of reasons. For one, is there's a lot of speculation about whether Tippett had a, a role in any conspiracy. That's not provable and not been proven at this stage and probably never will be. But it's also important because... Um, yeah, the, the, the Warren Commission said that, that Oswald killed Tippett, and the reason it's important to their case is because it establishes a propensity for violence. That's right. And also mm-hmm. a need to elude uh, you know, any authority, a need to elude capture. You're listening to Night Fright, Wednesdays from 3 to 5 in the afternoon, and from 10 until midnight at night. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. Just for the younger folks, uh, Officer Tippett was killed about 40 minutes, I would say, after President Kennedy. President right. Kennedy was killed at 1230. Officer Tippett was killed around 110. And they believe Oswald killed him while walking down the street. Officer Tippett pulled him over and asked Oswald what he was doing, and Oswald shot him. That could be a whole other show. <laughs> uh, let, me, let, me, let me finish sure. this one thing, because it's interesting. Um, okay. That Aquila Clemens, when, when Shirley Martin was, was interviewing her, and I've got this in a written typewritten uh, transcript of this interview she's she told mrs martin more than once uh, that that the police warned her not to talk to anybody about what she witnessed on november 22nd and so Shirley asked her and i quote again so the police said you'd get a lot of publicity and you better not do it and aquila clemens replied and i quote yeah i'd better not might get killed on the way to work so Shirley asked her if that's what the police told her, that she might get killed on the way to work, and she said yes. And quoting again, then she said, they'll kill people that know something about that. There might be a whole lot of Oswalds. So, oh, <laughs> that's pretty ominous and revealing. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. And that's all in the book, folks. Uh, we are speaking with John Kellen. John Kellen has a great book out, which I finally got from the shelf behind me, called Praise from a Future Generation, The Assassination of John F. Kennedy and the First Generation Critics of the Warren Report. And you can pick the book up uh, right here at Chapters on the Kingsway, which is really great. It's very convenient to uh, just go over there and ask for the book, and it is available. You can also pick it up at Amazon.com if you want to go there. I want to plug the JFK Lancer website again. I keep coming back to these folks because they're terrific. They are instrumental in helping me get guests for uh, the JFK assassination series in November. They are associated with a great conference that goes on every November around the time of the assassination, and John was there giving a lecture this year on his book. The website is www.jfklancer.com, and Lancer, of course, was the Secret Service code name given to JFK. The name of that, you should probably mention the name of their conference, because they call it November in Dallas. Oh, is that right? Yep. You see, you just educated me again. I didn't know that. <laughs> so all that information is available on the website, as well as links to uh, John's book, and there's a great forum there, too. Again, Lancer, was, Lancer was associated uh, for a, a number of years with uh, the late uh, Mary Farrell. Mary Farrell, another of the, uh, yeah. the, uh, the early critics, who unfortunately I did not get a whole lot of information about. And I'm um, sad to say is uh, kind of underrepresented in my book. And if I ever get the opportunity to... Uh, she always wanted to keep a low profile, though. That was more yeah. her... Uh, she was a grand lady. Yeah, I, I interviewed her a couple of times, mm-hmm. and, and she said she was you know, inclined to help me. But uh, it just never panned out. I mean, I, I tried. We met in person uh, at, I think it was the 2000 uh, November in Dallas, the Lancer Conference that year. Um, and uh, I talked to her on two successive nights. It was always a really late at night, and you know, it was like the end of a long day, and yeah. I was pretty tired, and she seemed pretty tired, and the room was filling up with people who just kind of wanted to kick back and, and have a glass of wine. And so it wasn't really conducive to a good uh, the kind of interview that I wanted to do. And mm-hmm. and follow up telephone interviews just never really worked out. I, I placed the calls, but we never seemed to connect in a really meaningful way. Mm. But she was a she was a legal secretary. Uh, I, I really should mention her. I, I, oh, please, I, please, yeah. yeah. Uh, she was a legal secretary in Dallas. She lived in Dallas uh, 
uh, originally, I think, from Tennessee, but she was relocated to Dallas, mm, I think, in young adulthood. I don't know exactly when. And then at the time that Kennedy was shot, uh, she was on her lunch hour. She was not a Kennedy supporter, uh, by the way, and so because of that, she wasn't compelled to uh, go see the motorcade when it was driving through mm-hmm. through town that day. Um, and she was having lunch, uh, I think, in a, in a place called the I think it was called the Southland Center, uh, about to maybe ten blocks or so away from Dealey Plaza. And uh, when she came out from lunch, she came out onto Elm Street, and uh, she heard about the assassination from somebody up just a passerby, and somebody had a radio and. And she heard uh, on that radio, she heard a description of, of the suspect. And she told me that at the time that uh, it, the description was so general that mm-hmm. she figured there's no way they're going to catch this guy. You know, there's I mean, how many millions of people in the in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex? There's just no way. So I guess she had the rest of the afternoon off. Uh, uh, and she went home, turned on the TV, and she hears about Oswald having been arrested. And she sees right away that he doesn't match the description that she'd heard on the radio <laughs> an hour or so earlier. Mm-hmm. So she, you know, once again, you know, something's not right here. No kidding. And over the course of the next few days, uh, with the help of her husband and her sons, she got a copy of every edition of every Dallas paper. And uh, with those as her starting point, she began compiling a list of, of witness names and their whatever their connection to the case was. And... Um, that developed into, at one point, is something like 40,000 in, uh, index cards, like three by five index cards of names. And uh, later on, she uh, had that stuff transferred onto a, into a computer by the time, I guess, the late 70s, or early 80s. Uh, she also worked on this thing uh, with, with, a, with a guy named Arch Kimbrough. And I, it's not clear to me how they, how they met, whether they, whether they knew each other before the assassination or not. Uh, he's one of those people that, uh, Arch Kimbrough is, is unfortunately, is uh, one of the loose ends that uh, I've got in my book. Um, so she, she and Arch Kimbrough, though, began working on what they called chronologies, and as that sort of implies, just mm-hmm. chronological retelling of events leading up to the assassination and and, and the period after it. Um, and uh, Mrs. Farrell also amassed just an enormous collection of, of articles and books over the years that related to the assassination. But as you noted, Brent, uh, she, by choice, was pretty much a background figure during her lifetime. And in later years, uh, uh, though she was uh, very closely associated with uh, JFK Lancer Mm -hmm. and and spoke at, uh, I guess, most of their conferences up until health prevented her from uh, from making it. Um, And I was lucky enough to meet her on several occasions and do those interviews that I did, even though they weren't as good as I'd hoped. It was still... Pretty, uh, pretty wonderful to be able to meet her and talk to her. Just let me plug her website because her legacy lives on on the internet, and it is maryferrell dot com. I think it's dot com. I don't yeah, think that's it. the Mary Farrell Foundation. That's right. And again, this is another well put together website, and it's put together by a fellow by the name of Rex Bradford. Yeah, Rex Bradford, and also it's uh, Tyler Reaver, another person that close to Tyler Weaver is yeah. uh, associated with that also. Another good guy, and JFK Lancer, of course, which is triple w jfk lancer dot com. You're listening to CKLU ninety six point seven FM, triple w cklu dot ca on the internet anywhere in the world we are speaking with john kellen and john kellen has a great book out praise from a future generation which is available right here at chapters what i really liked about the book was it really brought to life life in the 60s and what these people were facing as individuals before the computer era i mean now we're so accustomed to if we want to find out any information at all in any research right away you just go to google and google it and, you know, 6,000 pages show up on it. It wasn't like that in those days. You either had to go to a public library during the hours that it was open, or trying and, as John was alluding to, connect with different people from around the world, or around the country in this case, to exchange information. So it was a completely different way of trying to do research. I guess that's what I'm trying to emphasize also, is that these were individual people. These were not professionals. Private citizens. Private citizens. There you go. And acting unofficially. 
completely. And even today, most of the researchers are private citizens. They fund themselves. They don't make any money off these books. They do it for love of country, patriotism, and because they want to know the truth. And in a democracy, I want to emphasize this to the younger folks, we are the government. The government is us. We are responsible ultimately for the people we put in power, and they are ultimately responsible for us. They have to answer to us. We don't have to answer to them. And I want to emphasize that. If you think something's wrong, get out there and question it. You're listening to Night Fright, Wednesdays from 3 to 5 in the afternoon, and from 10 until midnight at night. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. And now your host, Brent Holland. We're going to go back to John now in his book. I'd like sure. to say something that's a little bit redundant because it's uh, much of, so similar to what you were just uh, saying. And what, what really fascinates me about these early critics, uh, they usually called, as I said before, the first generation critics, was that, as you noted, they were mostly ordinary people. Mm-hmm. You know, they did this work, these unofficial investigations in, into the Kennedy assassination completely on their own and out of the sense that something wasn't right. And most of them didn't know each other, as we've mentioned, but they had this, what they had in common was this absolute dedication to the truth and the conviction that the story coming out of Dallas, that one lone nut, namely Harvey Oswald, shot and killed President Kennedy on his own, was false. Exactly. And I would also like to make a point, you know, we, we often hear the term these days, conspiracy theorist, mm-hmm. and often, uh, too often, in reference to those of us with an interest in the Kennedy case. And I think it's one of those terms that has really become pejorative. You know, it's almost always used to demean somebody or Absolutely. dismiss them outright by characterizing them as Absolutely. some kind of flake, you know, like a conspiracy nut. But as far as these early critics go... It really is a shoe that doesn't fit. The objective of the first-generation critics that I've written about, at least during the earliest years, was really not so much to solve the mystery of of who killed JFK, but what they really wanted to do was get the case reopened. And they they actually came pretty close to succeeding it. Uh, In um, 1966, uh, a, a congressman from New York, a Republican congressman named Theodore Kupferman, was sufficiently influenced by some of the articles of, of, that he read, mm-hmm. like Weisberg's articles, and another guy named Edward Epstein, who actually wasn't a first-generation critic, but he came along you know, soon after, quite of a, I guess a second uh, generation. Uh, so Kupferman read some of their work and was sufficiently impressed and influenced that he, he proposed... Uh, a, uh, uh, a resolution uh, in Congress to not to reopen the case, but to set up a, uh, I guess, a conference committee or some kind of committee that would reevaluate the the Warren Commission's procedures and their work to see whether a reopening of the case was justified. So I think that was in September of '66 that he uh, made that proposal. And uh, when that uh, Congress uh, uh, recessed, um, his, his, it, it just died. It was not acted upon, and he, he, he had to. It was reintroduced, I think, the following spring, and it met like the same fate. It just nothing ever, nothing. It just never flew. Nothing ever happened with it. But it was, you know, it caused some some excitement. They thought they were really making some progress. The mm-hmm. critics did. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think and then the Garrison case came along. The and, Garrison uh, case, and in the seventies, I think had these researchers not done their work in the sixties and kept this alive in the seventies, there was the House Select Committee that finally mm-hmm. opened it up. I disagree with their. Well, I can't say I disagree with their conclusion because their conclusion was it was a probable conspiracy. Right. But, that's that's a strange thing about the yeah. Select Committee was that that uh, you know they they reached their own conclusion, but it did not necessarily invalidate, if that's the right word, uh, it didn't overturn the Warren Commission's conclusion. It was a separate entity with a separate conclusion. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so that leaves us with two official U.S. government investigations, one of which says there was no conspiracy, and the other one says there was a conspiracy. Although, of course, the, the Select Committee House Select Committee uh, was unable or, or declined to define that conspiracy, but mm-hmm. still, it's, 
is, uh, uh, I think, in uh, uh, historical curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> That's well put. I do want to get to two researchers before we've only got a half hour left. Ray Marcus, David mm -hmm. Lifton. I think we're going to have to leave Penn Jones, unfortunately. Sorry, Penn. I'll leave it up to you. There's the three. No, uh, we'll talk about whatever you want. Uh, I, I'm still uh, in regular contact with Ray Marcus. And, oh, uh, please, let's talk about Ray. And David yeah. Lifton, I know, has got a new book coming out soon, so I would like to cover. Well, you know, uh, when did when did Mary Farrell die? It's been three or four years, and I remember seeing her at a, one of the Lancer conferences seven or eight years ago, and mm -hmm. she got a big laugh when she was in front of everyone. She said something like, "I want to live long enough to, to I hope I live long enough to see David Lifton's new book." So I got a pretty good laugh. He's been working on it for a long time. I'm sure it'll appear eventually. But, uh, <laughs> According to a good friend of mine, probably you know him too, Leno Sanic. Uh -huh. He was saying that uh, he was on Leno Sanic's show a few months ago, and he was saying Lifton that it, was? Yeah, it's coming closer to fruition. Oh, Keep good. your fingers and toes crossed. Ray Marcus. Can you tell us a bit about Ray Marcus and sure. uh, how influential he was? Yeah, Ray Marcus uh, was uh, a Los Angeles businessman. He still lives in L.A. Um, we uh, I visited with him last spring when I was out there. My wife's from there, and we were back there uh, touching base with the in-laws and hmm. managed to find time to... Uh, to uh, meet up with Ray. Mm -hmm. He was a Los Angeles businessman, uh, really specialized in three areas of the assassination. Uh, the, the Pruder film, uh, Commission Exhibit 399, which is the so-called uh, magic bullet mm. of the single bullet theory fame, or infamy, I should say. And uh, the third area that Ray Marcus specialized in was a photograph of the assassination taken by a bystander named Mary Mormon. Yes. So Ray began studying the case on his own uh, on the very day of the assassination. <clears throat> and I think I said this earlier, because I'm looking at some notes in front of me, I think I read this before, that he described his skepticism by saying, by the evening of, of November 22nd, 1963, I found myself being drawn into the case. The government was saying there was only one assassin, that there was no conspiracy. It was obvious that even if this subsequently turned out to be true, it could not have been known to be true mm. at that time. Exactly. So that's that's what really got him started. He made this uh, exacting, very exacting frame-by-frame -frame study of the Sapruder film, and he started virtually right away in November 1963. Uh, Life magazine published 31 frames from the Zapruder film in its, I think, November 29th, uh, 1963 issue, uh, which I believe was the first publication of any of the Zapruder film frames. And then uh, after the Warren Commission published its uh, its 26 uh, set, the 26 volumes, um, I think most or all of the Zapruder frames were published in Volume 18 of the Hearings and Exhibits. So he, uh, although I should add that they were very poor quality, um, but he had access to all of the frames of the Zapruder film, which is, um, in case anyone doesn't know, I should mention that that's the the filmed record of the the film of the actual assassination that was taken by a, a bystander, a guy by the name of uh, Abraham Zapruder. It's the most common film you've ever seen of the assassination, folks. Just do a, a Google again on JFK assassination film, and I'm almost 90% for sure that's the one that's going to pop up. If you've seen the movie JFK, that's the film that he shows. Yeah, in the I'm, and I'm, I'm almost, I'm not, I can't swear to this, I'm almost certain it's on... Uh, on YouTube, I'm not sure all the. Oh, people, it is. It is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure how that works because uh, the the rights to the film, I think, are owned by the uh, Sixth Floor Museum. Oh, uh, is that right? I thought it Dallas. went back to the Zapruder family. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I, I'm pretty sure that. I mean, I I, I use a, I had a frame of it uh, in my book, and um, I had to pay for the rights to Ooh. use it, and that's who I. <laughs> sent the check to. So Gary Max is a happy man, is that right? He went out for supper well, that night. I'm teasing, was, I'm teasing. Uh, not a huge check, but... Uh, I was teasing, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I, I, they're, they're usually pretty, uh, pretty uh, zealously protecting their rights, mm -hmm. so I don't know... Justifiably. On YouTube, That's cool. how do you track it down? I don't uh, know. you can't. As a composer musician, my biggest problem is pirating. People just download the music for free, and that's it. I'm left struggling to try and feed my family, you know? Yeah. Anyways, that's another 
thing. Another another subject for another time. Absolutely. So Ray Marcus is studying the uh, the life images and 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 also the volume eighteen the Pruder frame images. And he came to the conclusion after first seeing in in uh, November of 1963, he came to the conclusion that uh, that there might be a way to show that the official version of the assassination was false, just based on the photographic evidence. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what what led him to to think that uh, in the in the in the um, presidential limousine um, were uh, um, two people were 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 hit that day? It was. JFK, Kennedy, right. of course, yeah. and then uh, Texas Governor John Conley, who was seated in front of of Kennedy in the uh, in the limousine. Um, Ray determined that the position of uh, Governor Conley's body as he sat in the limousine was um, was of a was of a man who had been wounded by shots that were fired from the left rear rather than Oswald's alleged position. Which would have been at the right rear, mm-hmm. and specifically, the, he, he Ray detected an, an almost imperceptible drop in Connolly's left shoulder, uh, and this is by his frame by frame analysis. analysis. Mm-hmm. And he wrote up his views in a in an unpublished paper that he called uh, "Hypotheses Regarding the the Pruder Film," and it was just a, a study paper that he passed around to uh, to other critics that he was by then uh, by that time. Uh, in contact with, he completed that I think in March of 1965, and uh, and he calls all of his conclusions. Well, he doesn't call them conclusions; he calls them hypotheses. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, anyway, that was uh, it's a little bit about Ray Marcus. Um, anything else you care to talk about, Ray? I'd be happy to. You're listening to Night Fright Wednesdays from three to five in the afternoon, and from ten until midnight at night. Your voice in the dark for paranormal. Conspiracy Radio, and now your host, Brent Holland. Well, I think that was essential, especially in those days, because very few people had seen the actual film. You know, as I say, people just can go to, to YouTube now and watch the whole darn thing and, and analyze it themselves. But in those days, it was essential for folks like this to do it. And it really... He could have been one of the first ones to actually say, look, uh, you know, this film shows that the shot came from the front. I think that was important for the public at large because, you know, it was a snowball movement, I felt. And now, uh, certainly, I think the stats are something like 78% of the population believes that the Kennedy assassination was a conspiracy. And again, it comes back to that early foundation of these researchers had they not kept it alive through the 60s and 70s which was the crucial time to keep it alive especially given that there was no internet or any source of communication i think all of that would have been lost and we would still be living the lie i think most people now have come to realize that there is indeed has been a conspiracy mm-hmm. yeah that, that's the interesting thing about the, the pruder film is that mm-hmm. uh, time life uh, immediately purchased all rights to it and uh and it was essentially suppressed. I mean, these these frames were published in Life magazine, but um, we mentioned Penn Jones a moment ago. Uh, mm-hmm. Penn said somewhere along the way, uh, when, when was it? He, well, I guess when he said it is not the, the the important thing. The important thing is he said that all you really need to do is see the Zapruder film, and and to understand that Kennedy was shot from the front. And, exactly. and I totally agree with that. I, I don't see yeah, how anybody can see that film and have any other interpretation than that he was shot from the right front. I, I mean, agree. it's just so obvious from from the uh, the reaction of, of, of his head and upper body being slammed backward and to the left. Uh, and I, one of the, isn't it a Newtonian law of the transfer of energy? Uh, That's right. That, mm-hmm. uh, like a pool ball, you know, like you, you hit a pool ball and, and the, the, the cue ball hits the ball and then the, the ball that's struck continues in the same, uh, in the same direction that, that, uh, that the uh, cue ball came from. It's the same with the bullet striking Kennedy's head and it continues in the same direction that it was fired from. That's right. So it had to have been fired from the front. I had Sherry Feaster on here. And uh, as you know, she's a senior CSI, crime scene investigator. Sherry Feaster? Mm-hmm. She did a whole analysis of the Zapruder film, bloodstain patterns and everything, and she found uh, she would have testified in court that Kennedy had been shot from the front, from the opposite side of the grassy knoll, 
but from the front. This is completely contradictory to the Warren Commission, as we both know. And that's a senior CSI. So there you go, using modern techniques. So she would have testified in court that, no, 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 wait a second. The fatal shot came from the front. Right. Again, if these early researchers hadn't kept this subject alive... Hmm. Um, let's talk a little bit about David Lifton, young David Lifton at the time. Okay. Can you tell us what the catalyst was for him that got him involved? Was he a, a physics student, if I'm not mistaken? He was a, a graduate student uh, at UC, I think UCLA. I think it was UCLA, uh, yeah, yeah. At the time, and um, and I believe it was in physics, as you said. I believe that's correct. And... You know, when I when I wrote my book, I had to use a very narrow definition of the term first generation critics mm-hmm. because you know, it's like the more I researched and started plotting out an outline, the longer and more involved it got. So I had to really draw the line. So by my very narrow definition, uh David Lifton was not a first generation critic. Uh, Vince Salandria tells me I'm full of it. He tells me I'm wrong. <laughs> says David Lifton, as far as he's concerned, he is a first-generation critic. Um, so uh, I, I, I defer to Vince, uh, certainly, on this on that matter. But strictly speaking, he did not get involved on the day of the assassination, and that was the narrow criteria I, I used. Uh, oh, okay. Just to kind of okay. hold the line on this project that was that was just mushrooming out of control. Yeah, that I bet. said, I, I do bet. know David, and I've interviewed him a couple of times, and and he do, it does factor into my book. Um, apparently, he uh, I mentioned uh, uh, Mark Lane's uh, uh, speaking tour that he was on in the That's United right. States, yeah. and I was it in. I think I think David Lifton, I believe, is from New York, although he spent most of his adult life in uh, L.A., um, but it may have been in New York uh, that he went to see um, Mark Mark Lane mm-hmm. on one of his early speaking uh, engagements, probably in late 1964 or early 1965, and uh, and uh, he, to his surprise, to Lifton's surprise, he came away thinking... <laughs> Yeah, there really is something to this. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he went very skeptical, thinking, you know, this. Yeah, I think he, he, David Lifton later on wrote a very uh, uh, influential book called Best Evidence. That's right. And um, and uh, he wrote. Uh, he, it relates some autobiographical information there as his involvement with the case. And he said something like, "I went to see Lane to, as a lark, almost the same way he might have gone to see somebody argue that the the Earth is flat." Uh, well, that that kind of attitude, like he was going to go see some nut, you know, give a speech, <laughs> and he came away thinking this guy really makes a case. Mm-hmm. So that that uh, kind of drew him into into his involvement. He wound up getting a copy of the twenty six volumes and and uh, a set of the twenty six volumes, I should say, and um, and uh, uh, studying all the early issues. Um, his Really, is his major contribution, I think, in the early period, the early years, uh, was the discovery of um, what uh, a rather controversial subject uh, that I go into in some detail in my book. And I wish, just for a moment, we were doing television and not uh, not uh, radio, because this is a very visual uh, matter. We mentioned Ray Marcus. I mentioned mm-hmm. Ray Marcus a couple minutes ago as uh, one of the areas that he studied was this photograph taken by Mary Mormon, Mary a Mormon. photograph of the assassination that I think it roughly corresponds to the Pruder Frame 313, which is when Kennedy is, is hit right. in the head. Yeah. It's a black and white Polaroid photograph taken from the opposite side of the street uh, that uh, the Zapruder film is shot from. Uh, in uh, the Mormon photo, was not uh, any included in the official evidence, um, although apparently it, it appears that in, in a obscure sort of way it does appear in a f- picture of a newspaper that's somewhere in the twenty six volumes. But can I just interrupt you here for a sec? Oh, I sure, just sure. want to tell the folks that aren't familiar with this photo. It shows JFK head coming off, and it also shows the grassy knoll, although it's in the shadows because there's a bunch of trees there. It shows a pergolia, I guess you could call it, that's right next to the grassy knoll to the right, and I'll just mm-hmm. let it go with that. Okay, yeah. Uh, that That's a pretty good description uh, of, of that, the Mormon photograph. 
So even though it was not included in the official evidence, it was not entered into evidence, um, it was included. It was it was made it to the you know Associated Press wires. It was seen everywhere. Uh, it was published in newspapers, and it was also included in this booklet called uh, a commemorative booklet published right after the assassination called Four Dark Days in History. Mm. And David Lifton was, I guess he saw it in a bookstore while he was standing in line, and he was just sort of flipping through this this magazine or commemorative booklet. And he starts looking at this Mormon photograph, and he thinks that he can make out figures in uh, in this shadowy area that you just mentioned mm. uh, up on the, the grassy knoll. So he bought the booklet, took it home, and studied it with a magnifying glass. And um, he identified five suspicious areas that he thought there might be uh, some some possible assassins up there on the knoll. And um, he knew of Ray Marcus. He didn't know him personally, but he knew of Ray Marcus, uh, who, like Lifton, was in Los Angeles. And so I guess uh, he got together with Ray, showed him what he was looking at in this Mormon photograph, and Ray became very interested in this also. And uh, I, I said that uh, they, they were looking at five possible images. They really did, kind of zeroed in on two of them, but they numbered them left to right across the photograph. It's number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. And number two and number five, they felt were the most promising, the two that looked most like human-like figures. And... Uh, so uh, I think David Lifton actually wound up, he, he studied it very intensively for several months. In fact, he said to me that something like, this is almost a direct quote, he said, study of number five image dominated, or maybe it was study of the Mormon photograph dominated my life in, 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 May, and, in June, May and June of 1965. So he studied it very intensively for a for a couple of months, and then he moved on to other things. But Ray remained interested in, in these in this photograph and these two images in particular. And um, he actually wrote a monograph about it, uh, about the number five man that was published. Uh, he, well, he published it himself as a monograph, but it's, it is available. You mentioned uh, Andy Van Archik in the last Hurrah Bookshop mm -hmm, in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I think Andy probably has a copy of it. That's just a fascinating uh Sort of subtopic of the whole the whole assassination is the Mormon photograph and these these images up in the shadows of the grassy knoll, and this uh, it's, it's called uh, I think it's called November twenty second nineteen sixty three uh, or number five men November twenty second nineteen sixty three. It's by Raymond Marcus and uh, it's available uh, probably uh, to this day and uh, just one of those really fascinating. Uh, Areas I, I, I go into uh, into this issue, the number five man issue, in considerable detail in my book, uh, and um, it really is it's uh, surprisingly underpublicized. Um, yeah, I didn't know about it. Uh, I yeah, think I mentioned and that I, to you. Yeah, and I'm one of the few. My book is one of the few that actually contains that that image. Some people... Could I just interrupt and say, for those of you in the know that are familiar with the Mormon photo, we're not talking about badge man here. Right. That, um, I think is number two, man. I think they're the same as Badge Man. Okay. If you pan over to the right, almost at the end of the picture, in the pergolia, you're going to see a figure there. And it almost looks like they're holding a rifle, in the same sense that Badge Man looks like he's holding a rifle, but it's not the Badge Man area. How's that? Right. If you're looking at the, at the Mormon photograph, in the foreground, you see a, a Dallas police officer. He's got his big white motorcycle helmet on. And it's almost directly, number five minutes, almost directly above um, that motorcycle helmet. That's a good way of putting it. Very good. Yeah. I, like I said in our pre-production meeting the other night, I never heard of this before. And uh, sure enough, there he is. And to me, it looks like there's somebody there. I'm halfway convinced that it could be a, a shooter. I think there was multiple shooters in Daly Plaza that day. I really do. Um, yep. Yeah, me too. But I do agree with Sherry. I think the head blowing off shot does come from the opposite side of the grassy knoll. And uh, David spotted that. Do you want to talk a little bit about his groundbreaking work? Or is that sort of later on and not really the scope of, of what you want to talk about tonight about the book? We're referring to his groundbreaking book. Best Evidence? Best Evidence. Thank you. Good. Yeah, I, I really don't go into that in, yeah. in my own book because that, that kind of happened later. Okay. Uh, my my book enough. pretty much ends uh, with the Garrison trial. Although there's a there's a there's a uh, 
sort of an afterword, I guess, or an epilogue that kind of brings everything and brings it up to date with kind of a where are they now. But the, the book essentially chronologically ends uh, in about late 1969. We've only got five minutes left. The garrison trial was actually in my notes to talk about. <laughs> Probably ought to. Probably ought to, just to sort of uh, sew on the button. Uh, okay. Um, bring everything Because that, that, that kind of brings everything together. Jim Garrison was the uh, New Orleans district attorney. In, uh, the, throughout the 1960s, uh, he was the DA there at the time of the assassination mm-hmm. and, re- and remained so up to the early 70s. And he began his own investigation it was beginning in uh, late 1966 and uh, wound up uh, charging uh, a uh, New Orleans businessman named Clay Shaw with complicity in, in the assassination. It was an extremely controversial case and... Uh, the uh, case went, although he was, Shaw was charged in, uh, I think, the spring of 67. The case didn't actually come to trial until uh, the winter of 1969, and Garrison lost and lost badly. And uh, um, uh, it uh, remains a controversial subject to this day. Uh, the um, Some of the early critics were closely associated with uh, the Garrison investigation. Mm-hmm. Vince Landria, Mark Lane, uh, Harold Weisberg, especially Lane and Salandria were, uh, were had a, worked in sort of an advisory capacity, especially in the earlier That's right. uh, yeah. phase of the investigation. And Weisberg was also closely associated with it. And um, Weisberg, Mark Lane, and Raymond Marcus all testified to the grand jury in uh, the spring of 1967. Um, uh, at the time that the uh, charges were still developing against Shaw. So it, its significance, uh, in, insofar as the critics go and my book goes, is that um, there was a great deal of excitement when this case first came along, um, but it ended up uh, being very controversial, sort of drove a wedge into what had been critic solidarity. And uh, it was one of those situations where there was just no middle ground you were either for garrison or against him and sylvia marr in particular was convinced that that uh, was that garrison really had no case and was was uh, was uh, prosecuting an innocent man and uh, and it, re- it really destroyed the uh, the relationships that had uh, developed between um between these critics um and, well, you uh, had mentioned the Garrison trial ended, Garrison lost the trial. I should also mention, if you watch the movie JFK, the jury actually believed Garrison that there was indeed a conspiracy. They felt Garrison had convinced them that there was a conspiracy. It's just that Garrison never convinced them that Clay Shaw was involved. Correct. That's, that's absolutely right. He uh, say he easily demonstrated that, that the uh, there was a conspiracy to kill mm-hmm. Kennedy. Um, he just f- failed to connect Shaw to it, as you just said. We're going to have to wrap it up now, John. That was incredible. Two hours, just like that. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, buddy. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I appreciate your having me on tonight. Oh, it was my pleasure. Definitely, you've got to come back. There's no question, because there's a lot more here, folks, that I wanted to cover. And in two hours, it's hard to cover 15, 20 years in two hours. We never got to General Edwin Walker. I wanted to talk about him. And, oh, there's all kinds of stuff here, my notes. In uh, me back. Oh, I'm game. Okay, my friend. Consider it done. We'll figure out a date. You'll be back. Okay. We have been speaking with John Kellen. John Kellen's got a terrific book, Praise from a Future Generation. The book deals with the first generation of JFK researchers. What's important here is these researchers were private citizens that kept this investigation alive through a crucial time the first years after the assassination. John's done a masterful job in his book. He puts you right in the 60s. I found myself on several occasions making a peace sign, putting a headband on and saying, groovy and uh, far out. (laughs) Let me me mention one last thing very, very quickly. uh, Is that uh, Praise from a Future Generation is the book. is published by Wings Press in San Antonio, Texas, and distributed by IPG, uh, Independent Publishers Group. Okay. For all you book buyers out there, book distributors out there. And for you people that want to buy the book, you can pick it up right here at Chapters. Thanks again, John. Thanks Thank so you, much. And uh, I'll be in touch. Thanks, everybody, for listening to Night Fright. 
We'll see you next week. You're listening to Night Fright. Wednesday nights from 10 to midnight on CKLU 96.7 FM. Your voice in the dark for paranormal and conspiracy radio. (laughs) 